The topic of the series is holistic neurorehabilitation, and each week on every Sunday we will be covering a different aspect of uh, rehab. Uh, next Sunday we will have a speech and language pathologist uh, along with Shraddha to talk about integrated neuro rehab. Uh, the week after there will be family-based interventions in neuro rehab that we will cover. And the last week will be with a consulting neurophysiotherapist as well as uh, uh, Shraddha Shah, who is a consulting psychologist to show how uh, a team effort is used in the field of neuro rehab. All right. Uh, should we begin uh, our webinar today? Yes, I think, Rovina, let's begin. Uh, just so that we have enough time to ask questions at the end. All right, thank you. All right, so let's begin. All right. Our understanding of the human brain and how it functions has constantly been changing over the last few hundred years. In the 1700s, phrenology was popular, which said that the contours on our skull can predict our personality traits. Since then, our views have changed, and especially in the last 100 years, it has been changing every decade with new advancements in technology. In the last 20 years, we have seen that individual areas of the brain that were responsible for specific functions. But now our understanding has evolved where we know that there is a loop of functionality. Different brain, different brain areas work together so that we can complete a cognitive function, especially higher order executive cognitive functions. For example, we know that Broca's area is responsible for speech production and Wernicke's area is known for speech comprehension. But these two don't act individually. Both these areas are connected by the arcurate fasciculus that comes together to form the functional neuronal connectivity loop for language. Diffuser tensor imaging, which is the image as you can see is on the left, is a type of imaging technique. This helps us provide unique insights into the brain's network connectivity. In 2009, the Human Connectome Project was launched with the goal to build a network map of the brain to shed light on anatomical and functional connectivity within a healthy human brain, as well as produce a body of data that will facilitate research into brain disorders. Neuroplasticity. What is neuroplasticity? The word plasticus or plasticos means capable of being molded. It describes the brain's ability to modify its connections or rewire itself. Neurogenesis is the process by which new neurons are formed and this continues throughout our lifespan. Synaptogenesis is the formation of synapses between neurons in the nervous system. Synaptic plasticity is the biological process by which specific patterns of synaptic activity result in changes in synaptic strength and is thought to contribute to learning and memory. Synaptic pruning is a natural process during which the brain eliminates extra synapses. A living example of the concept of neuroplasticity is Barbara Arrowsmith Young. She was born with several cognitive disabilities. She had difficulty with spatial relationships, grammar, logic, word pronunciation. She had difficulty telling the relationship between symbols, even telling time on a clock. But she was gifted when it came to visual and verbal memory. Early in her life, she came across the work of Alexander Luria and Mark Rosenweig. She was introduced to the concept of neuroplasticity. So she took it upon herself and devised brain-stimulating activities. She would uh, train herself, especially in areas where she had cognitive difficulty. She worked for hours each day, and she did notice that after a time, she got faster and better. She saw an improvement in tasks that she once found very difficult. She opened the Aerosmith School in Toronto in 1980 to help individuals with learning disability. Neuroplasticity as a concept, I'm sorry, can be applied to behavior as well, not just cognition. The brain is classified into areas based on function. That is what those arbitrary lines dividing the brain depict. To understand how the brain functions, we have to look at dysfunction in the brain. 
the dysfunctions that are listed here give us the information about functionality. The infographs that you will see in the following slides are available on our Instagram page, which you can access at a later time for your reference. I will be showing you videos of these dysfunctions next. These are videos of patients from whom permission has been taken to use these videos for teaching purposes. Damage to the temporal lobe can cause memory deficits. What I'm going to show you is scores of a subtest from a neuropsychological battery, which is the Addenbrooke's cognitive examination. What the scores of a memory subtest look like. This is done in two parts. First, the client is asked to repeat a three words, which is lemon, key, and ball. After a while, there is a man's name followed by his address, which is seven words, which they repeat three times, following which there is an immediate recall of these words. And then they are tested again on the same list of words after about 15 minutes to assess delayed recall. As you can see, the scores are severely impaired for the standard deviation range that there is. Another section that the same test measures is naming or word finding difficulties. Semantic information is stored in the anterior temporal lobe and an injury here can cause difficulty with naming. So client would have difficulty naming what this is. So they wouldn't be able to say wristwatch or pencil. This is functional impairment of the parietal lobe. Damage to the parietal lobe can cause visual neglect, which is a cut usually in the left side of the visual field caused by damage to the right parietal lobe. As you can see here on the right, this is a line by section task test used to assess visual neglect. As you can see the client, the task is to divide these lines in half. And as you can see, they've left out the left side of the page. Even when copying figures, they tend to not copy the left side of the page, mainly because they just cannot see it. The occipital lobe, Damage to the occipital lobe, we can, you can usually have trouble visually recognizing these objects. And this can lead to perceptual errors. As you can see, they have, they, they're unable to recognize the object correctly, so they sort of name it differently than what it actually is. Like for example, this mushroom is actually something that they would say is a lamp. We look at the brain stem now. Damage to the brain stem can cause difficulty in swallowing. We now look at the limbic system. What you see here are actually quotes from a patient's wife who suffered a traumatic brain injury. As a result of this injury, there was severe hypersexuality as well as emotional dysregulation. As you can see, it says he would touch me inappropriately in public. At times, he would chase me around the house. He became overtly sensitive to emotional situations. His mood was extremely volatile, changing from anger to laughter in a matter of minutes. Damage to the limbic system can also cause hormonal imbalance. A 12-year-old patient who suffered a traumatic brain injury at that age only got her first menstrual cycle at the age of 17 years. We have to remember that our body functions as one unit. We call it a brain injury, but our brain and body are connected. And when this brain is injured, or when the brain is injured, it impacts different areas of our functioning. The brain is responsible for everything, not just cognition, but also emotion, behavior. Every aspect of our functioning is what the brain is responsible for. So, even a simple, so when we're do, taking a history for a patient, you know, and there are several different uh, complications that we see, or there are several different deficits that we see, just adding a simple question to our history taking for FOMA that says, have you ever suffered a head injury or a brain injury can help us piece a lot of this information together. At this point, I would li like you to please make a note of your questions, which we will uh, allocate time towards the end to answer. Now, 
Ms. Shraddha Shah will take over. Thank you, Rowena. Rowena, for the rest of the videos, uh, can you please increase your volume a little bit more? Yes, um, sure. It was better, but um, still not completely clear. All right. Uh, so there's um, Rovina will actually continue to share the slides. So, all right. So let's begin. Um, we had Rovina actually give us a very good um, summary of the anatomy of functional impairment. Now, um, we looked at very um, sort of very um, basic classifications of the brain. Um, however, our idea over here was to get you to recognize that um, there are different parts of the brain that are responsible for different functions. And as she spoke about the connectome, the human connectome project in the beginning, um, now our understanding has uh, progressed a lot more. And what we understand is that these different specific areas of the brain um, that are responsible for a very, um, so we have now a very detailed understanding um, which part is responsible for helping us recognizing human faces. For example, we know to that detail. Then we know uh, what is responsible for um, the expression of language, the comprehension of language, and how all of that comes together for creating functional loops. When you put that together with our understanding of neuroplasticity, which means that the brain can heal itself, the brain can change itself based on our activities. So our experiences change our brain. Now that has been the foundation for neuropsych, uh, well, overall neuro rehab. Before we go on to actually talk about neuro rehab, I want us to um, understand <clears throat> understand why it would be required. So the classification of these injuries, um, it's important for us to just get an idea of what these injuries are going to be like. So an acquired brain injury is anything that you were not born with. So if it's not developmental, then it's acquired any time from the first day of a child's birth all the way until their death. Um, ABI is further classified into a traumatic brain injury versus a non-traumatic brain injury. So a traumatic brain injury would be something where um, it can either be an open skull injury or a closed skull injury. Now what that means is, um, Rowena, can we go to the next slide? Um, all right, sorry, the next one. Yes, so um, a traumatic brain injury could be open skulled, which means that there would be damage to the skull, uh, to the surface of the brain, or to actually the um, mass of the brain. So the subcortical structures can also be damaged, probably because of maybe piercing or uh, some sort of a blunt force, um, which means that it's a contact uh, traumatic brain injury. That can happen because of a fall, that can happen. I mean, there was a very freak incident a few years ago at um, Shivaji Park where um, people were playing sports and somebody was actually practicing archery. And he ended up um, piercing somebody, um, a young child actually, with his arrow through his brain. Um, and um, the, the other child did not die, don't worry, but um, definitely had a, a pretty severe brain injury. So uh, things like that would be contact injuries. And there are a few terms which I don't really want to get into at the point, at this point. The second one, um, a traumatic brain injury can be inertial. Now, what this means is it's the physics con concept of inertia. Let's say that you're moving fast and then you stop suddenly. So then the brain, which is sort of in a cage, 
of the skull. It's in limited space. It's going to hit against the skull, which means that there can be edema, there can be swelling um, to maybe the front of the brain, and sometimes it can ricochet, and there can also be a contracoup injury, which means that even though you were pushed to the front, you can actually injure both parts and sometimes all parts of your brain. Also, what happens is the brain can get overstretched. So the connecting fibers inside, which are the axons of the individual neurons, can get overstretched and damaged. And this can mean diffuse damage. The, um, the sort of differentiating factors between contact and inertial injuries is that contact injuries were usually very well aware of where the injury has taken place and we can actually prognosticate what kind of difficulties the individual will have. However, with inertial injuries, it's usually diffuse damage, which means um, that funct global functions can be impaired. And those, even though we might think that, oh, there was no blood and no surgery that was really required for the brain, uh, that it might somehow be a milder injury, usually actually not the case. Um, all right, Rowena, can we go back so that I can just talk about the non-TBI uh, injuries? All right, so these are non-contact uh, or non-traumatic injuries, and they are usually internal. So anoxia is the uh, uh, reduced oxygen supply to the brain uh, because of various uh, reasons. It can be a cardiac arrest, it can be chronic sleep apnea, um, it can also uh, happen actually because of a drug overdose, um, a stroke, which can be, um, so brain stroke, we can call it maybe a paralytic stroke or um, hemorrhage. Those are different terms for a stroke. It can, um, a tumor actually, if left unchecked, can produce lots of functional deficits and, um, degeneration, an example would be uh, Alzheimer's dementia. So these are uh, lots of different causes for brain injuries. All right, Rovina, can we move forward? Now, my idea is to get you to recognize why it's so important for us to talk about this. Uh, we hear of stats related to mental illness these days a whole lot. For the last couple of years, mental illness and mental health has been gaining a lot of recognition, which has been groundbreaking and it's absolutely fantastic. However, it's also important to look at the rest of the functions of the brain. Um, and these stats are unfortunately very, very stark and absolutely horrifying. So um, what we know is about a hundred point, uh, sorry, 1.6 million people are going to suffer a traumatic brain injury this year. A million people out of these are going to need long-term rehabilitation because of this traumatic brain injury. So of course there will be high mortality rates. Um, so there will be deaths. However, there is also going to be a huge number of people who will have very high morbidity. So they will continue to have damage uh, and live with that damage. Um, now that is a traumatic brain injury and 60% of those traumatic brain injuries are because of road traffic accidents. Um, I think maybe the font is not clear, but community-based studies in India have shown that prevalent, uh, prevalence rate of stroke. Now, once again, we're quite aware of uh, research and how variable it can be in India. So um, the range, uh, in these studies uh, epidemiologically go from 44 people per 100,000 to 843 uh, people uh, per 100,000. But we do know that the second highest uh, cause um, of mortality in India uh, is a stroke. Now, AMCI is amnestic mild cognitive impairment. This is usually the stage um, sort of prior to dementia um, in the elderly. Sorry, somebody is 
Yes, sorry, it was not on mute. All right. Um, yes, so the current prevalence of amnestic MCI, as you can see, is a really, really large number, 45 lakh people. Um, and uh, yes, just one clarification, MCI doesn't always progress into uh, dementia, which is why I said kind of can be seen as a precursor. All right. Um, yes, and the prevalence rates for dementia are variable, How, uh, but we do need to recognize the fact that they are very, very high for a country of our size. And um, in the next 10 to 15 years, we are going to most likely be leading in the number of uh, dementia patients in the world. All right, so now coming to what do we need to do about all of these injuries? What are the um, options that we have uh, to help patients uh, who have suffered a brain injury? Um, Rowena mentioned that we're going to be conducting um, this entire series, and this is just the first part of the series on holistic neuro rehab. So um, today, as we speak about uh, neuropsych rehab, we uh, need to understand that neuropsychology is the study of the brain and its functions. The functions um, are cognition, emotion behavior, as well as all of our psychosocial functionality. So rehabilitation is a set of measures that help an individual who has suffered some sort of an injury to regain as much functioning as possible. Rehabilitation is different from recovery. The idea over here is to regain maximum self-sufficiency in all of these different areas of functioning. So <clears throat> um, now the field actually um, was developed as a result of all of the injuries that soldiers and troops had suffered in the world wars. That's kind of where it started. The aim was to rehabilitate um, these soldiers. And of course, as you can imagine, um, there were lots and lots of brain injuries at that point. <clears throat> all right, uh, Ravina, can we move forward? Yes, so what is the aim of neuropsych rehab? A little bit of which I told you. So the idea is to help recover and rehabilitate as many functions as possible. Now, whether uh, we use uh, cognitive retraining to improve the functions, or we use counseling and other therapeutic techniques uh, to uh, help the patient recover in different areas, um, the use of several different therapies and techniques come together. <clears throat> Now, um, uh, yes, so just continuing with this, um, improvement in everyday uh, life and improving the, uh, the individual's quality of life is something that um, is always at the foundation of everything that is planned in the uh, rehab process. Now, what we use is the neurobiopsychosocial model. Um, the biopsychosocial model is something that um, is usually part of our uh, psychology uh, training and education. And uh, here, because we're working with uh, neurological injuries, we do need to learn about um, being able to read imaging uh, reports at least um, basic. Uh, ability to read them. So the medical history and the presenting complaints always go hand in hand, which takes us back to what Rovina was talking about. If we know that the frontal lobe was injured, then we should be able to um, hypothesize and prognosticate the kind of complaints that we need to look for. Now, why is this important? Because when we're taking a history, very often we do know that clients don't always have the right terminology to come in and share their complaints. So if we know what a symptom is supposed to look like, 
then that helps us to probe in the right kind of direction uh, in the right kind of direction knowing the individual as a whole is going to help us take them towards that whole now what that means is where did they come from what is their cultural background what was their occupational background what was their education like all of these things create the individual's personality prior to this one event so the idea is not to make the injury the identity of the individual but to look at what they were like and help them create a new identity for themselves despite the injury so the injury is just a part of them the idea is not to let them or the family think that that's it now for this individual also very important um is to be able to look at um this individual as part of a larger structure so which means that the individual is at the center then comes the family then uh, then comes their extended family and friends society their occupational setting all of these different areas all of these different resources that are available to the individual need to be used and can definitely be used um the week after next um august 2nd i think rovina is going to be speaking about um specifically family based interventions and family support family support is very important as you can imagine because the injuries as we're talking about acquired brain injuries are usually always very sudden so the family needs a whole lot of support to actually process and learn how to deal with this situation all right um so now how is rehab actually done how do we um create this plan a little bit of which i already told you getting the right kind of information about all of these different areas uh is very important to help take the individual to the right direction which means um that best case scenario would be to help the individual get back to completely independent functioning completely independent cognitive functioning would mean that hopefully they would be able to get back to um we're assuming that this is an adult who um was completely self sufficient had a job or had uh, or was responsible for running the household so had responsibilities outside of just themselves and managing just their own personal life so whether that's a job at a company or a teaching position or actually running uh, a household they require their cognition and behavioral control to actually be independent in all of this emotionally and psychosocially being independent enough to manage a uh, healthy relationship this is the best case scenario let's say that this is something that might not be possible with a very severe brain injury um because there is definitely going to be permanent damage so then the next uh, best situation which is functional independence and helping them create a new identity and in whatever form possible helping them uh, become productive members of society so that might not mean uh, being able to uh, do all of the original things in complete uh, sort of entirety however there are things that can be done which make the individual's life more meaningful purpose and meaning is always always very important uh, positive psychology and positive neuropsychology show that this is the cornerstone for joy and contentment in life as well as improving our health span and age span also so lots of these things are kept in mind to create a holistic plan the idea of holistic neuro rehab or uh, sorry holistic neuropsychological rehab is that the program that we create the treatment plan that we create it needs to be based on physical cognitive executive communication psychosocial and functional uh, improvement so of course you can imagine that the assessment 
when we actually meet the patient also has to include a whole lot of these different areas. So it's very important that we actually work with other, um, other professionals. And that's why the rest of the, uh, this series of Sunday webinars. We do want to show you how we work with speech therapists. We want to show you how we work with physiotherapists because we're viewing the individual as a whole. And apart from all of this, um, we want the individual to function within their own environment. So ecological validity for the tasks is very important. So each plan um, is customized to the client. So of course we work within specific theoretical frameworks, but each plan is always customized uh, to the individual and the family. All right. <clears throat> All right, so now let's talk specifically about what is cognitive rehabilitation. Sometimes um, uh, individuals actually undergo purely cognitive rehabilitation. And uh, these are some of the activities. Okay, so I'm just gonna explain now this task. This lady is a master's in sociology. And for a brief period, she was actually teaching sociology in a university. And uh, I'm just gonna give you the profile of SS. He um, was in his mid twenties when he suffered the uh, road traffic accident and um, has, a, I think a master's, uh, no, a bachelor's in uh, commerce. And um, I think a diploma in computer uh, engineering from what I remember. Um, and he was holding an independent job at a leading company actually when this happened. Now this lady over here, uh, the idea why I'm giving you their background is so that you understand that how intellectually proficient they were prior to the incident. If you couldn't uh, sort of hear things properly, she was struggling with finding the name. And when she was provided with the cues, so the phonemic cues, um, t -t, she could get tomato. Um, for the cucumber, she could actually describe it. She said that you take the peel off and then it's quite nice inside. You cut it in slices and eat it. So she, she was able to describe it. The description is available. However, the uh, categorized uh, term that actually holds the rest of this information. The term, the word uh, cucumber is something uh, that is not easily accessible because of the damage she has suffered. Uh, the rest of this task, the reason why we're doing this is because we want the lady to start doing some of the things that she was earlier responsible for in the household. She was responsible for buying fruits and vegetables. Um, that that was um, the big stuff that she actually would do. They had enough help at home, so she wasn't involved in too many day-to-day -day other activities. And to make her feel productive, we wanted her to actually be able to start doing this. So if you see next to her, there's a piece of paper on the left and which has a shopping list. Now, this is the sort of simulation of what a a uh, supermarket would be like. And using a list, uh, we are training her to actually go and pick out the right kind of uh, fruits and vegetables. So um, it's a very slow, staggered process to help her do this. Yeah. All right. Right, so um, on the left over here, you can see an activity, which now is a paper pencil activity. So there are paper pencil activities, there will be computer tasks that we do, there will be these kinds of simulation tasks that you saw an example of. Um, so over here on the left, as you can see, this is category fluency. Um, this is a frontal function. And um, uh, what, we're, uh, what we, uh, sorry, it's a temporal function. Um, what we are uh, looking at over here is the description, excuse me, the description of a particular function and then their ability to actually come up with uh, different um, objects associated with that. 
and on the right you can see it's a um, again it's a fluency task language fluency and it's their ability to piece information uh, together and create um, uh, new words so some of these are things that you know we were probably we did them for fun when we were younger and the idea is to get creative and constantly uh, change the activity that we're doing for the individual, but always work within a cognitive theoretical framework. All right. Now, um, behavior rehab. What does this mean? So we looked at neurocognition and now we're looking at neurobehavior. Now we're going to be speaking about emotional function um, and how a psychologist, so a clinical psychologist, a counseling psychologist can actually be involved in the process. Now, because of the way our education system in India is organized, there are very stark, clear divides between what um, specific psychologists can do. However, um, if we were to put our counseling expertise to use by getting some theoretical um, understanding of neuropsychology, I definitely do believe that we can come together to provide the right kind of holistic care to uh, individuals. So once the injury has occurred, a neuropsychological assessment is conducted. Um, and based on that, there's a plan that's created to help the client build awareness and based on that also cognitive interventions. The second part of the uh, neuropsych assessment is the neurobehavioral assessment, which is a neuropsychiatric component to it. So emotions and behavior are assessed. So there could be a specific scale just for impulsivity. There will be a scale assessing only frontal behaviors. There will be um, depression and anxiety scales. And that's where the psychotherapeutic intervention can be planned from. Um, right. Now, psychiatric outcomes of a TBI. This is very, very important. And um, I definitely do want um, our um, everybody who is here today to really take note of this, because I know that majority of you are actually psychologists or psychology students. And I know a whole bunch of you are also psychiatrists. So, um, <clears throat> Psychiatric outcomes of a TBI include very, very commonly depression, anxiety, uh, loss of behavioral concerns, as I actually named. Now, if you were to just view that one instance of hypersexuality, where, and actually it was a newly, newly married couple. I mean, they hadn't even been married for a year when he suffered that brain injury, um, where the hypersexuality became such a huge problem. So you can imagine what kind of a strain it would have put on that relationship and what kind of distress and burden, emotional burden it created for the caregiver. Um, yeah, um, Jovina, there are random marks on the screen. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so all of these psychiatric outcomes can actually um, be helped sometimes by psychiatric medication and a whole lot of the times by psychotherapeutic support. Um, all right, moving forward. Anisognosia. This is one of the most common uh, consequences of a brain injury. Very often the most complicated to actually understand and deal with. What this means is this is a term for impaired self-awareness. One of the initial videos that you saw um, where um, uh, I was questioning the client about what happened to you. He said, Cub, when did something happen to me? Is what he asked. Uh, okay. Um, um, Sorry, I got distracted by those lines on the screen. Yes, so um, he did not remember. He was not aware. He 
had no recollection of this happening to him. So the recollection and the recall is of the event. Now, because the brain is injured at that point, it's not encoding any memories. So that's why the recollection does not happen. But the self-awareness is something that is impaired as a separate function of the brain. Um, and this is related to metacognition, which is the function of the brain. So knowing about knowing. So I know that I know um, how to conduct a neuropsychological assessment. So when you ask me, can you do it? I will be able to say that, yes, I can do it. Um, here the individuals do not know that they've suffered a brain injury, do not know that they have damage. So very often um, it can have very dire consequences. If an individual does not know that they have some sort of physical damage and imbalance, they will try to get out of the bed unattended and can have a secondary injury. This is unfortunately very common actually for people um, who have this symptom. Apart from that, you can imagine that participation in the process of rehab is going to be non-cooperative and limited. People, let's say that there is an individual who is the CEO of a company and is used to actually calling the shots um, and is used to being completely independent and well-revered. Um, he's not going to be willing to, or she's not going to be willing to actually listen to um, uh, people telling them that, okay, now raise your hand this high and let's um, tell me the date, let's look at the calendar. All of this becomes very difficult when we have self-awareness uh, deficit. And um, this particular paper by Crossin, written several decades ago, actually, um, is one of the most sort of groundbreaking work that he's done, where he's talking about self-awareness and how there are different levels to self-awareness. I'm going to speak about anticipatory, just to get you to recognize what it would be as at its best. Now, let's say that um, I know that a certain situation, possibly going into a big group, is going to really um, uh, stress me out. So I will prepare myself beforehand. I will make myself um, aware of the kind of difficulties that might come up. So I will anticipate what's going to come up. And, um, and based on that, uh, put the right kind of uh, sort of um, um, outcomes or sorry, the right kind of strategy. So we're going to walk you through a, a poster that we had presented at a, um, um, at a conference and um, I'm going to try and get through it very quickly. So uh, rehab began in April 2016 and um, ended um, in sort of, I think, February um, uh, 2017. Um, the, I'm just going to actually, uh, Rubina, just one second, stop there. Yeah, now as you can see on the uh, top right, um, we have uh, sort of tried to use clip art to kind of uh, show you with the brain and how it's sort of filled. So there's a full brain where we're talking about the pre-morbid personality and his background. Then we move to the injury and um, what he was like when he actually came to us, the kind of injury um, presentation. Then when we move forward about four months, there was a secondary um, second assessment uh, to track progress. Then again, in about four months, one more uh, assessment. Uh, so that we have objective scores also to guide, guide us apart from just functional skills. And uh, then finally, at the end, um, what was his uh, continued functioning like? All right, and now I'm going to walk you through the details. Okay, so uh, this individual, he actually, excuse me, sorry, he suffered um, a subdural uh, hemorrhage and um, this happened in December 2015. He also suffered a secondary post-surgical hypoxic injury. 
so he had to undergo a surgery and uh, because of that he had a hypoxic injury uh, as i mentioned secondary injuries are unfortunately pretty common making things uh, more difficult for them he was in the icu for a month now my idea in telling you all of this is for you to recognize or sort of at, at least be able to gauge how uh, severe the brain injury was um all right so a formal neuropsych assessment at the point that he came to us was not possible in april when he came to us it was not possible um yeah provina go ahead so there was severe uh, disorientation at the point we uh, we tried um, in april when we began the process to uh, create the assessment uh i mean to conduct the assessments when he came to us in jan it was not possible and um by april we got an idea of his functioning and what ability uh, were actually able to create this so the ace is the addenbrooke's cognitive exam um it is um it's a global screen and has a little bit um uh, of every cognitive domain sort of so orientation um remote memory language skills naming skills um also the ability to encode and recall information uh the goat is the galveston orientation uh, and amnesia test now that is uh, specifically a test to um assess post traumatic amnesia uh this is something that um it's a stage immediately after the injury and can actually um continue from a few hours to several months and sometimes actually it can remain permanent also certain research shows that and um based on the duration of the post traumatic amnesia we can actually also prognosticate uh, prognosticate outcome for the individual the colibri is a quality of life scale and uh, once again very important to not just look at uh, cognitive um, outcomes and cognitive consequences of the injury um the rehab process over here uh, we create goals which can be long term goals and then specific short term goals within a time bound um uh time frame and that's what smart goals mean um so specific measurable achievable uh realistic and time bound that's the acronym now because um the client can come to us only for a limited amount of time over here we don't um have too many intensive inpatient rehab centers um evidence based research actually shows that creating home based rehab plans and involving the family and their extended support structure uh provides really good outcomes that's what we always do we train the family in how they can actually participate in the process and um uh, this is something that rovina is going to speak about to you in lots of detail on august 2nd um all right so rovina yes and then a few months later we actually uh, interviewed the wife this time around to get an idea of what was happening at this point uh because he started gaining a lot more self awareness and um we could look beyond the most sort of stark difficulties that he was having we were able to um identify a whole host of uh neuro um behavioral symptoms at the point as you can see increased aggression and anger um because um now he was sort of more independent and aware that's when he started actually um losing motivation now it's a little counterintuitive but when the client is completely unaware rehab is very um is very uh passively done for the client which means that they are actually going to be pretty compliant um when the goals become a little more higher order um that's when um their participation becomes very important so at this point we could see that he became non cooperative 
and started refusing assistance also where it was required. So our goal at that point, um, as you can see, is on the bottom uh, left of the screen. We've listed a lot of the goals that we had. All right, Rowena, let's uh, let's move forward. Um, at this point, uh, by this point, we had already started to see lots of cognitive gains. The first thing is that we could add a lot more assessments. Now, which means that actually to be able to um, use assessments itself uh, means that the individual was able to perform on cognitive tasks, and that by itself is a gain. Um, so the ACE uh, improved to 73. The GOAT went from 19 to 94. Actually, the scale consists of questions like, what is my name? Um, what do I remember of the injury? Um, what was the injury like? What is the date today? What is the year uh, right now? Um, those kinds of questions, very orientation and amnesia-based questions. So now we knew that he was out of the post-traumatic amnesia state. And then we conducted a whole bunch of these different assessments. Uh, the FAB is a frontal assessment battery, and uh, the ABS was uh, behavioral uh, symptoms, and the Colibri, as you know, is the quality of life. Once again, there, were, there was a plan created for home-based interventions, family interventions, in-session interventions, always very, very holistic. And um, we had identified what were the goals that had been achieved as well. All right, Rowena. Um, and by December 16, there was once again more assessment. Over here, as you can see, now the GOAT was not required because um, it was for the post-traumatic amnesia and that was done with. So we continue to track only with the rest of the um, scales available. And by this point, as you can see, the new plan includes travel independence. Now he didn't need his wife to actually accompany him, which is um something that used to happen in the past so for all of the sessions she would be sitting outside um and just waiting for him uh to be done return to work he did start going to work in a limited capacity um and cognitive stimulation is something that then we had to continue not rehabilitation um and continued physical exercise so he had progressed from the level of um physiotherapy and we still continue to give them a home-based intervention plan. All right. Um, yes. And then by the end of it, by about Feb, when we stopped our regular session with him. So this is now Feb uh, 2017. Um, yes. So you can read that he goes to work twice a week. He answers phone calls, is able to now email clients also. and. Um, walks every morning, travels alone, uh, handwriting has improved. So there's lots and lots of different areas of functioning, as you can see, uh, that um, uh, continue to actually uh, be impacted, however, also improved. Um, he actually became the head of a support group and um, as I told you, a lot of the clients who actually go through rehab become advocates for um, getting more people uh, to recognize rehab and its benefits. And in this situation, he actually started heading a support group that um, we started. So um, actually, he was involved from day one and continued to actually uh, lead it. Um, I think at one point he also did an interview, I think for a, a newspaper. Um, yes. Yes, I think it was, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was the Mumbai Mirror if I'm not wrong. Um, all right, so I am going to actually wind it up over here. I'm going to leave this up on the screen for you all to just see. Uh, there is, um, yeah, Rowena, we'll have to skip the second case presentation. I think I took too long. Um, we have a few minutes very quickly for questions. Thank you so much for listening. And we definitely do hope that this was useful. I am going to um, uh, just 
give you all a uh, uh, few questions to answer. So please do take this poll of questions and answer. Uh, it'll definitely help us um, for the next few webinars. Um, so the question should be up on your screen. Ah, yes, okay, now I'm receiving a few uh, replies. And at the same time, let's please uh, ask us questions. Um, all right, so lots and lots of questions. Rowena, you wanna start um, answering them? I'm also going to start quickly answering them as people answer. <coughs> I mean, as people question, yes. All right, somebody asked if they've registered again with the following workshops, okay, trying to see. Shada, would you like to take this question? What is the difference between neurocognitive disorders and neuropsychological disorders? Ah, yes. Okay. So, uh, well, neurocognition, very simply to understand, is actually um, a part of uh, neuropsychology. Uh, neuropsychology, as I mentioned, involves emotion behavior as well. And um, so neuropsychological rehab would go on to include the rest of those functions uh, being addressed as well. Um, excuse me. Uh, just one second, I am going to um, reply to any other questions that we might have. Uh, I hope that that answered the question. Let's please quickly ask a few more. Is brain plasticity better in children as compared to adults? So uh, this is actually a really good question. It is something that... Um, so neuroplasticity, uh, yes, is uh, better for younger brains. They are understood to be more plastic. However, it does not end um, until actually the end of life. Um, can we have the recording of this seminar and the following seminars? Uh, yes, uh, Apiksha Pai, they, uh, these will be available um, after some time on YouTube. Even though awareness is increasing, it's still hard to convince people that they need to see a professional because of their denial, absolutely. And how we deal with it is something that I'll tell you, it's been very, very difficult to get them to recognize it, but it is always, always just teaching them about it. So learning about how it can benefit people, which is why we really wanted you to watch patient videos. And, um, just knowing about that means that you will be able to help them understand which in which areas it can improve their life and um, why they should definitely actually uh, go through with it. What are the difficulties faced in uh, illiterate people? Okay, so actually quite a few difficulties. However, um, as I mentioned repeatedly, it is um, always functional activities that we uh, address. So functional activities would mean the responsibilities that they um, actually um, usually participate in. So it does not have to be challenging cognitive activities. And um, in India, actually very surprisingly, Illiteracy and literacy does not always translate into um, less functional responsibilities. So illiterate people also actually can be um, participative in very, very um, uh, technically sort of challenging activities. Uh, so if I was to give you the example of a farmer who came uh, uh, to me, he actually was very good at calculations um, of the um, and classifying his um, uh, produce in two different areas uh, superb at organizing how to actually uh, get it sold how to store it um, so when we say illiteracy he might not be able to write an essay for you 
but um, cognitively he could be completely actually proficient. Is brain plasticity? Yes, okay. Just that, can you please get a dedicated webinar on neurodegenerative disorders with detailed neuropsychology. Yes, actually we are planning to do that. Um, possibly after this entire series on neuro rehab is done. Can you give me some insight on metabolic disorders? Yes, so that actually, you know, there's going to be so much information about this. Um, I uh, would actually really urge you to read more about it. And if you contact us separately, we can share a lot of research with you. Um, so glad that you all found it useful. Um, how does cognitive independence and recovery translate to functional independence? Cognitive no, 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 no. Both are different aspects of rehab. What assessments were used to assess the ADL and IADL status of the clients? So uh, ADL and IADL, we actually use um, the CAT uh, scale. So it's a checklist uh, for the um, uh, IADL. And um, for ADLs, we actually use just subjective reports from the family. And um, also as part of IADLs, we use lots of uh, behavioral and functional um, skills individually depending on the uh, symptom that is being, um, that is, uh, being uh, reported. How does cognitive independence and recovery translate to functional independence? Um, I'm pretty sure that I actually uh, described that in a lot of detail. Um, Cognitive independence is, you know, when I gave the example of, um, I'll go through it really quickly once again. So let's say that the individual is now able to um, stepwise organize the thoughts, starting the computer, then connecting, um, I mean, starting like clicking on Google Chrome, going to Gmail, um, maybe typing in the password, typing out an email, so when they can cognitively actually uh, restart to do that or start to do that, that means that they will be able to possibly get back to work or get back to maintaining uh, social relationships with their friends and family abroad uh, through email. So um, it would be very task uh, specific. I hope that's a good example. Both are different aspects of rehab. Yes, they are, absolutely are. Um, what are the techniques to manage uh, agnosia? Uh, that is something that we can once again uh, discuss with you in detail. Um, we work with uh, neurophysiotherapists uh, in conjunction to actually address this. And uh, we can, uh, why don't you join us for uh, the August 9th uh, talk and you will uh, learn a lot more. Um, the e certification. All right, yes, we, okay. All right, so we're done with everything. Uh, we're sorry that we don't actually provide a certificate. And it's something that, um, you know, we're, we, uh, we're not an institute. We, um, we don't feel comfortable with uh, giving you this. It's our idea of conducting these webinars is to create awareness. And it is not to actually, um, you know, teach. Um, it's something that we would just want you all to become aware of and um, maybe contact us separately if you want to learn more about it. But e-certification, I think, would come from people who actually are part of institutes. So, um, all right. And thank you so much for your responses. We would um, like to thank everybody yeah. for coming. I'm sorry, Shraddha, I cut you off. Just a quick uh, no, no, uh, announcement yeah. out there. Uh, I see still a lot of questions are coming in and I'm sorry, due to time limits, we're not able to answer each of them. But if you send us a me message on Instagram, on our Instagram account or uh, an email to Synapsium India, uh, we will be able to answer them for you out there in detail. All right. I am going to request you all to actually uh, rate us, please, on um, Facebook uh, and Google, if you all do find the time. It would be very helpful uh, if you all could do that and uh, support us. 
thank you so much for joining and uh, see you next sunday thank you bye